They were five wacky Brits with big dreams. I want to be a pop star. Looking for fame? My ambition is obviously to make it really big. And a lot of fun. It's just mad. As you can imagine, five teenage girls let loose into a house. The world came to know them as the Spice Girls. Scary, sporty, ginger, baby, and posh. In the next hour, we'll follow these outrageous entertainers on their overnight journey from pop star wannabes to divas extraordinaire. They were just like naked ambition coming at you. If you think you know the real story, you don't. You'll meet the ambitious girls. She was able to kind of wrap guys around her little finger. The vicious girls. Everyone says, God, you know, you must, you must feel absolutely gutted. And the girl who called it quits. I wasn't really happy. We'll learn about the band's meteoric ups and downs and the day the dream came to an end. I can make anybody understand my departure from the Spice Girls. This is the story of excessive behavior and unbridled drive. We are doing exactly what we, what we want to do. We're pursuing a dream. This is the story of the Spice Girls, the E! True Hollywood Story. On June 28, 2007, the biggest selling female pop group in British history confirmed the rumors. Seven years after breaking up, the Spice Girls were reuniting. We felt an enormous amount of support from a lot of people to get back together. Yeah. So we're doing it for ourselves, our fans, and you know everyone out there. Mention England, and you may think of a country that honors tradition. But in 1995, the Spice Girls turned this reserved country upside down and curled even the stiffest of upper lips. With their colorful costumes and cheeky antics, these five English lasses set out to rule Britannia and conquer the world music scene. The group was the brainchild of an ambitious, then 22-year-old music manager, Chris Herbert. In 1994, Herbert noticed the English pop scene was overrun with boy bands like Take That and E-17. He decided the timing was perfect for an all-female group. At the time, I just thought to myself, you know, it's possible to kind of do this with, with a girl band, make it both sort of sexy and sassy, so that they become role models for young girls, um, and also, uh, you know, a, appeal to the opposite sex as well. Herbert's father, Bob, was a well-known record industry accountant. Bob was searching for a new project to back. Chris convinced his father an all-girl pop band couldn't miss. I think at the time he wanted to do a boy band and that was when I kind of just said, you know, let's do this instead. I think this one could work. Chris didn't leave anything to chance. Filmmaker Neil Davies. He pasted up a storyboard of what the band would look like six months before he did the auditions, just using pop magazines. We wanted the girls to represent a whole cross-section of, of teenagers in the country. And to have, you know, different shapes, sizes, heights, um, hair colouring, characters. The objective was not to have five look-alikes. In April 1994, the Herberts placed an ad in Britain's popular performing arts publication, The Stage. Nearly 2,000 girls responded. We sort of shortlisted it and then did more sort of induction days and uh, workshops with the final 12 or 13 or whatever it was. The first girl to catch Herbert's eye was Melanie Janine Brown, a 19-year-old dancer from Northern England. Melanie had been performing in gentlemen's clubs. Well, I'm Melanie Brown. I'm 19 years old and I went to performing art school. She's very fashion conscious, great looking girl incredible character and a very good dancer and had good singing ability as well so she kind of she was a good all-round package. Melanie easily bagged the first spot in the band. Next up was 19 year old Victoria Caroline Adams, a five foot six brunette from a wealthy London family. I went to um, dancing college three years, um, left there and I did um, fashion shows and trade shows and a few musicals and things like that. As cliche as it sounds, I think you can spot a star when they walk through the door. Two down, three to go. 18-year-old Michelle Stevenson was a drama student at London University when she heard about the auditions. I actually wanted to be an actress at that stage, so that's what I was kind of focusing on. I just kind of fell into it, really. I just went along for the audition because I hadn't been to an open audition 
life before, and I thought it would be good experience. Stevenson's hunch proved right. She nailed the gig. Michelle decided to put school on hold and join the group. Melanie Jane Chisholm, a 20-year-old singer from Liverpool, was recovering from tonsillitis when she auditioned. Even with a sore throat, Melanie's talents won Herbert over. I went to a performing arts college, and I was originally going to go into the theatre, but I'd much rather do this. One spot remained. I want to be a pop star. For weeks, 22-year-old Jerry Estelle Hallowell, a working-class gal from Watford, England, kept badgering Chris Herbert for an audition. On various occasions, she kind of kept on ringing into the office and really making a pest of herself. That like she couldn't get to one of the auditions. I didn't go to the audition because I'd been skiing and I burnt my face. Hallowell's musical training was spotty, to say the least. Jerry's resume included working as a game show host in Turkey. But what Jerry lacked in experience, she made up for in ambition. She gradually persuaded us to come along to one of the workshop sort of days that we, we were doing, where, you know, we really were down to our last few. But then I turned up to the, the small audition, where there was about 12 people, and I think I blagged it a little bit and just was a bit loud and um, just pretended to be Mariah Carey. And she walked in the room and... <laughs> you know, was as in your face and mouthy as ever and, and, and you kind of knew then, this is, actually this is the one that's kind of missing. I said to her, how old are you? She said, oh, I'm as young or as old as you want, want me to be. I could be a 12 year old with big boobs if you want. <laughs> and, and I think then we were like, yeah, she's got some real front, this one. Hallowell was in. Chris Herbert was ecstatic. He decided to call his group Touch, but the young manager had no idea just how touchy pop star wannabes can be. Coming up, out with the old, in with the new. But luckily we got on really well and they liked me and then Chick took me on. And later, Naughty and Spice. A whole bunch of pictures came out from the uh, sordid past of Jerry Hallowell. In 1994, manager Chris Herbert sensed a cavity in the pop music market that could only be filled with an all-girl group. He auditioned thousands and selected five performers who eventually became known as the Spice Girls. Along the way, the young manager became intimately familiar with something he never experienced before, a woman's prerogative. They were just like naked ambition coming at you. Chris Herbert and his father Bob were the creative minds behind the band. The Herbert's business partner, Chick Murphy, supplied the seed money. Chick Murphy, um, larger than life East London character, gold necklace, gold identity bracelet, open neck shirt, gold Rolls Royce. Murphy insisted on one thing. He didn't want a contract, because a contract would tie him down to a relationship. And he wanted to shift them about, move one in, move one out, and keep them on the toes, and keep them under pressure, and keep them a bit, you know hungry for it. Chris and Bob Herbert reluctantly deferred to their partner's demand. I would often argue with Chick about the girl's got to be put under contract. Um, you know, Bob being a, you know, a, an accountant, uh, understanding legals, and uh, he was very pro getting this contract sorted out. But Chick was, you know, no, this is the way we do it. And, and, uh, and we, we ended up going with that. The girls consented to Chick's plan. For the rehearsals, each band member was paid a weekly stipend of $96. In June of 1994, Mel B, Mel C, Michelle, Victoria, and Jerry moved into Chick Murphy's vacant three-bedroom house in Maidenhead, 30 miles west of London. The idea was to put them all into one house and, and let them start bonding and, and becoming a gang of mates as well as, uh, you know, have just having to work with each other. The idea worked perfectly. In fact, too perfectly. It's just mad. As you can imagine, five teenage girls in, in let loose into a house. Uh, it was uh, teenage hell. This bath is wicked. Can you wash my bag? From the first day, Hallowell staked out her position within the group. We just kind of went into the room and grabbed beds, really. And it was decided that Jerry would have the single room because she was the oldest. Jerry also seemed to be the most driven. We are doing exactly what we, what we want to do. We're pursuing a dream. Jerry is a really bossy one. He sort of like tells us what we're doing every day. I'm so ambitious and I just want to get there. No, no, no. Really, this, that's the whole point of it. I just want my ego fed, I think. 
Jerry's ego was only matched by her determination to succeed. Vocal coach, Pepe Lemur. I do remember always Jerry was at the corner uh, in, in that mirror while the others were having their tea and eating, doing her diaphragm, standing there and doing her movements and opening her mouth and going, ah, and I didn't even have to ask her any of that. It was always, always Jerry doing it. The group's schedule was rigorous. We eat, sleep and drink it really. We all live together. Wake up in the morning, go to the studio, rehearse all day, come back from the studio absolutely knackered and go to sleep. Sometimes you have to just remember what your aim is to get you through it because sometimes you get a bit down and a bit tired. The forced intimacy and rehearsal schedule didn't suit Michelle Stevenson. After four weeks, she quit. My mum got ill. Um, she got breast cancer, so I wanted to be with her. And obviously that took quite a lot of my time. And then university was coming up, and I just couldn't, I just couldn't do everything. The search began for Michelle's replacement. Vocal coach Pepe Lemur suggested one of her students, 17-year-old blue-eyed blonde, Emma Bunton. I went to Sylvia Young Beauty School, and then I did um, a BTEC performing arts at Barnet College, which I passed. <laughs> Emma's resume also included working as a model and appearing on television. I was so nervous and I thought, what if they don't like me? But luckily we got on really well and they liked me and then Chick took me on. For the next four months, the girls put in long hours rehearsing songs written by Herbert's associates, Erwin Keyless and John Thrice. Mel B designed the choreography. By September of 1994, the group was more than eager to perform. I never heard one negative, except only when it wasn't going fast enough for them. And what's happening? You know, we've got our songs, we've got our music, we've got the choreography. What's happening? I didn't really want to kind of jump the gun and, and take the, the quick option and fast track to, to the record company. I wanted to de develop them, to have an act together, a show, for us to get the writing team, production team all around it probably get sort of like three quarters of the album written and recorded and then take it as a package to, to a record company. But Herbert's plan didn't square with the outspoken Hallowell. Jerry pushed to do a showcase where the band could perform for record industry executives. I'm quite a motivated, enthusiastic person because, you know, I'm just feel like time's running out, I've got to get there. And I'm quite hungry for fame. The other band members joined Jerry's rally. The young manager was trapped. He had to deliver something beyond the kind of pain and boringness, you know, the, the tediousness of rehearsing every day. So he had to deliver a bit of glitz. This was going to be the bit of glitz. If this worked, the girls would love him, he'd get some money, everybody's going to be happy. But as the group prepared for the showcase, the girls appeared anything but happy. Mel used to get frustrated with Jerry. Jerry's a bit dizzy, <laughs> you know. She'd be thinking of a million things, so she wasn't necessarily focused. Well, I tried putting it out. I know I did because she forgot a bit, that's why. But we'll just do it again. We do have really bad arguments sometimes, really bad arguments, where there's things flying and there's swearing and it can get really, really nasty sometimes. We've got real extremes of people who don't like to say what we think and people who tell you exactly what we think. With just weeks before the showcase, the band decided the name Touch had to go. The girls wanted a calling card with some flash. Jerry was inspired by the title of a song the band recorded called Sugar and Spice. Hallowell thought the name Spice clicked. The other girls agreed. The group had the songs, the moves, and the name. All they needed was a little luck. It was all riding on this one showcase. Coming up, Jerry Hallowell makes her move. They talked about it and they said, yeah, Jerry came in to see me. You know, with not much clothes on, sticking out of the waggling her ass. By December 1994, the all-girl British band Spice was itching to perform. For six months, the group diligently rehearsed their moves and songs. Spice was ready to take on the world. But was the world ready for Spice? I'm going to have a castle with a swimming pool and um, an island in the middle.
In the winter of 1994, more than 100 record executives, songwriters, and music publishers were invited to No Miss Studios to watch the girls perform a series of songs. Hopefully this showcase will bring writers and bring new material our way and we'll have something solid. The girls were more than ready. Ambition. It's obviously to make it really big, really big with the group. I think we, we deserve it. It's, you know, if there's a God out there, I think we should make it. On December 7th, the girls took the stage at Noma Studios. The long hours of rehearsal finally paid off. I think the buzz was there already from the moment they came on that stage. Because they looked brilliant. Um, they started with that energy. The showcase was a stunning success. The girls were ecstatic. Their manager, Chris Herbert, was also thrilled, but one problem weighed heavily on his mind. You know, I was well aware we didn't have contracts. Probably a bit paranoid. You looked at them on the stage and they belonged up there, and uh, you knew that everyone in that room was thinking it. So, uh, yeah, we, I mean, we were nervous about that. Herbert had good reason to worry. As soon as the performance ended, music industry execs started circling. A number of guys approached Jerry and said, hey, look, I think you can be pretty big, why don't you come and see me? And that was where the rot set in. That was where, in Jerry's eyes, immediately she thought, right, it's bye-bye Chris. I've seen the promised land. I've seen guys in Armani suits and chauffeur cars. And she thought, go with the money. And why not? Jerry wasn't contractually tied to Chris or Spice. Hallowell took a meeting with another group of managers, and she reportedly wasn't subtle about her approach. They've talked about it, and they said, yeah, Jerry came in to see me, you know, with not much clothes on, sticking out her d waggling her ass, almost seducing me on the bloody table. I mean, not physically, but just saying, come on, you know, you've got to take us. The managers were interested, but they wanted the group, not just Hallowell, which meant that Jerry had to convince her bandmates to leave Chris Herbert. The girls were reluctant. She went back and reported to the girls and said, you know, I met these guys, uh, they'll, look, they'll sort out contracts, they'll sort out this, they'll sort out that, they'll get us money, we can make it with them. You know, we've been with Chris a year, we haven't done anything. Weeks after the showcase, Chris made a move to protect his investment. Finally, he presented the girls with a contract, but Jerry stalled. Often, you know, I'd argue with her, she'd kind of say, let's just go and get a song off, you know, can, can you get around to the publishers, get a song off the shelf, and let's, you know, go and cut a, cut a record and go and sign a deal, sort of thing. And it was, um, and that wasn't, that was never, that was never the plan. That month, Jerry and Mel B took a Christmas vacation in the Canary Islands. Jerry tried to convince Mel B to side with her and leave Chris. Mel B agreed. After the holiday, Jerry again approached the rest of the girls. She was always pushing for it, yeah, and as long as she, what she was saying the others agreed with, there was no stopping them, and especially if Mel B would agree with it. But Jerry had to put her plans on hold. Mounting career pressures left the singer in a state of depression. This wasn't the first time Hallowell suffered from mental illness. At age 17, Jerry battled the disease after a terrifying scare with breast cancer and again four years later when her father died. To make matters worse, Hallowell was also struggling with bulimia, an eating disorder. We weren't aware of it. I mean, she was, she was thin, she was skinny. Uh, she kept that very, very secret and the only person who knew was Mel B. It didn't remain a secret for long. According to Hallowell, in early January 1995, the singer checked herself into the psychiatric unit at Watford General Hospital in London. There, Jerry found peace and the prescription drug Prozac, an antidepressant. After 10 days, Jerry grew restless and checked herself out of the psychiatric ward. Hallowell returned to the Maidenhead house. According to Jerry, she stopped taking Prozac after she returned home. The singer claimed the drug robbed her of her creativity. In February, Chris Herbert asked Jerry and the girls to make their deal official. Chris wanted a contract because he thought, these are the girls I want. I'm not gonna change it, I've gotta keep them. But Jerry warned her bandmates that under the Herbert contract, they would have no say in the group's music, marketing, or promotion. Hallowell sought out the advice of music publisher Mark Fox. Jerry and the girls took no prisoners, and they saw me as an opportunity to introduce them to a new batch of people that they hadn't seen. Jerry came to me and said, listen, we like what you said. Can you help us find some writers to work with? And can you also suggest some lawyers that we should be speaking to? Because I'm not sure whether our contract is good, bad, or indifferent. And I'm not sure whether Chris and, and Bob, uh, Chris's dad, will be moving fast enough. Meanwhile, Chris Herbert set up a recording session with Elliot Kennedy, 
a successful songwriter who wrote the hit song Everything Changes for the Brit boy band Take That. Girls were to go up there on the Monday and we were now on the Friday. The girls were in the studio and I actually wasn't down there but an argument took place and uh, the girls all walked, stormed out of the studio. I said, we're not going to do this session until we sort out these uh, internal problems. And I pretty much put Elliot on hold until I knew what was going on. The girls didn't want to sort out their problems with Herbert. The girls left Chris a note on the kitchen table. It read, thank you for all you have done. We can't agree to the terms of your contract. The five girls split. They had nowhere to go and only $16 between them. Coming up, the Spice Girls bare their souls and bodies. We used to get changed in the back of my car, take the normal clothes off and sort of put the gear on. So, right, okay, we'll bunch your boots up and do this and lift your skirt up. In May of 1995, Jerry Halliwell and her Spice Mates bolted from their creator, Chris Herbert. The girls were excited. Chris was devastated. Everyone says, God, you know, you must, you must feel absolutely gutted about this. Well, you know, you're kind of like the, the guy that lost the, the, the lottery ticket. On Sunday, May 6, 1995, Jerry Halliwell and Melanie Brown traveled to Northern England. They were on a mission to find songwriter Elliot Kennedy. They didn't know where the studio was or anything like that, and they just went around local studios asking where Elliot's studio was. Sunday evening, I was working in another studio, and um, the phone went. She said, uh, Elliot, it's, it's Jerry here. I'm part of this girl band that you're working with tomorrow. We need to talk to you. Halliwell and Brown showed up on the songwriter's doorstep and displayed a little girl power. Jerry was being her best kind of um, seductive self in trying to convince me to work with them because they were about to fire their manager. Well, when is it going to happen when you're firing your manager? And they said, um, tomorrow. <laughs> oh, God, what are we going to do? You know, I said, well, let's just go ahead with it and see what happens. On Monday morning, May 7th, 1995, Herbert contacted Kennedy. I rang up earlier and I said, look, the girls, and I didn't really want to say that there was a problem or anything. I said, look, the couple of them come down with flu. They're not going to make the session. And I said, um, two of them are here. I said, I'm meeting the other three in an hour at the train station. Elliot's manager came back to me and said, look, the, uh, the girls are up here. Um, and, uh, and the, the session is going to go on. I said, well, you know, I want it pulled immediately. I've got, you know, some stuff that I, which I've got to sort out with the girls. And Elliot's manager said, no, you know, the session is underway and it's going to continue that way. At that moment, Chris Herbert knew his gig was up. And from then on, that was the end of our relationship with the girls. I was pretty gutted about it, for, just because of the amount of time we put in. That I was young, I would never sit there beating myself up about, you know, what, you know, what if, what if. The girls never looked back. That afternoon, Elliot moved the group into his home in Sheffield, England. It was madness. I went through so much toilet paper, which I, I don't understand what they did with it all. I couldn't stock enough toilet What do girls do with toilet paper? Spice continued to rehearse and write with Kennedy. Just days after moving into Elliot's house, the group recorded their first single, Love Thing. It ended up being a promo record for them, and then the second track we wrote after that was Say You'll Be There. The girls were thrilled with the results and decided it was time to find a new management team. Music publisher Mark Fox stepped forward. He helped kind of put them in touch with a lot of people as well. In June 1995, Fox arranged for the girls to meet with different managers and record execs at Sony, Columbia, and EMI. Music publisher Mark Fox. We used to get changed in the back of my car and get all the, take the normal clothes off and sort of put the gear on. So, right, okay, we'll bunch your boobs up and do this and lift your skirt up. I think the pop market is completely dominated by men. So, you know, we're just going to slot right in there. The girls weren't shy about pushing their girl power. So, everyone's going to know what are the Spice Girls. And then they'd barge down and without an appointment just push their way into the office jump in this guy's desk, say, we're the Spice Girls, we're the next big thing in pop, do you want us, or we'll go next door. They're dancing in front of you, 
uh, Jerry's got half a kit off in front of you. E e Emma's doing the whole thing about being a baby, whatever. And then Noel is outside sort of chatting up, as I said, the secretary, thinking what a way to the a &R guy's heart is to make sure that the girls in the office think you're cool as well. Fox realized the girls needed someone who could harness the group's high energy. In June of 1995, he introduced the group to Simon Fuller, a well-respected manager in the record industry. Fuller's client roster also included talents like Annie Lennox. They needed that kind of manager, someone who was going to be able to take what they had and put it on a world stage, you know, and Simon was perfectly placed for that. Former Spice Girls publicist, Nikki Chapman. When they came in to see Simon, they saw someone with vision who could take what they had and make it a hundred times bigger. And they played some music and it was very, very raw, very rough around the edges, but there was something there. The members of Spice were immediately impressed with industry legend Fuller. The question remained, was the industry legend impressed with Spice? Coming up, the Spice Wars. Jerry wanted to make a lot of the decisions, but you can only make decisions if you know all the facts. By June of 1995, the all-girl Brit band Spice was set to rock and roll. The group had everything going for them, but Spice still needed a manager and a contract. Jerry Halliwell was about to take care of that. She was able to kind of wrap guys around her little finger. Jerry Halliwell believed Spice could soar under the guidance of Simon Fuller, a legendary manager in the record industry. Lucky for the group, Fuller was impressed with the girl's energy and irreverence. I realised I wanted to become a pop star. I'm, I would say, um, a real wannabe. You know, I'm the last of the dying breed. I mean, want to be on smash hits as well, at the top of the pops and things like that. He saw something that he knew he could work with, and um, you know, and to and to make you know one of the biggest bands in the world. In July of 1995, Fuller signed the group to a contract. The terms were kept confidential. Fuller immediately started shopping the group around to record labels. It wasn't a tough sell. The buzz on the girls um, got to such a height, especially after everyone knew that they were working with Simon and his writers and producers, that um, it'd be fair to say that every major record company was trying to sign them. Simon Fuller decided Spice's high energy was perfect for the edgy record label Virgin Records. Journalist Rick Skye. Virgin might have been willing to give them more of a free hand than other companies. And I think that in his negotiations, uh, Fuller would have, would have seen that. For Fuller, the negotiations weren't just about control. The thing with Simon is that he's really creating something of his own. In a way, the record company are there just to distribute the albums and the singles, and even perhaps to fund it. Um, and obviously to make money from it. On July 13th, 1995, Spice inked a deal with Virgin Records for an undisclosed amount of money and a hefty signing bonus. The girls quickly got down to business working on their first album. They were doing something every single day, whether it be learning to co-write with the producers, whether it be um, dance lessons. I did media training with them. As always, Jerry was in the thick of everything. Jerry wanted to make a lot of the decisions. But you can only make decisions if you know all the facts. And I think it'd be fair to say that Simon actually made all the really big decisions. One of Simon's biggest decisions was to rename the group. Simon was concerned that there was a band, I think, from Germany called Spice. So they became Spice Girls because there was a problem contractually with uh, the name. In August of 1995, the Spice Girls traveled to Los Angeles to meet with Virgin's US-based execs. Virgin wanted the best press, the best TV, the best radio. They wanted the creme de la creme of the music industry to be working on this group. That's how important it was. After six days in LA, the Spice Girls returned to London to shoot their video for the first single, Wannabe. In June of 1996, the video played on a popular British television network, The Box. The response was amazing. Former Box production manager, Sam Sarkoub. The video was playing constantly. We were, we were playing Spice Girls like you know, almost once every hour. It was just unreal. Unreal was an understatement. Within a few months, the British public and press couldn't get enough of the Spice Girls. In August of 1996, Peter Lorraine, publisher of Top of the Pops magazine, interviewed the group and provided each member with their own nickname. 
Mel B turned into scary. I mean, I do like my animal pictures. I've got my leopard skin barn underneath this. The youngest member of the group, Emma Bunton, took the name Baby. I like to be quite comfortable. Victoria Adams became posh. I like quite basic clothes. I do like designer clothes. I'm a sucker for that. Jerry Halliwell transformed into Ginger. I just dress how I feel. I take responsibility for getting voted worst dress person. And last but not least, Mel C was sporty. I am sporty by name, sporty by nature. Journalist Andrew Harrison. You had this thing materializing. They looked like Josie and the Pussycats. They looked like a cartoon. They looked like superheroes. They didn't look like a band. They were a bunch of um, completely over the top women. Um, and they seem to be on a perpetual big girls' night out. The Spice Girls were about girl power, and their message was simple. You were five girls, you treat everybody the same, whether you're, you know, rich, whether you're a postman, you're, you know, the president, whether you're black, white, gay, straight, you treat everyone the same, whether you're royalty. Respect. That's it. In June 1996, the Spice Girls' first single hit the record charts with a bang. It was absolutely remarkable, and it just wasn't in the UK. Once we'd had a hit, the rest of Europe and Japan followed, and then the rest of the world. One month later, the group struck gold again with their single, Say You'll Be There. The Spice Girls appeared unstoppable. Coming up, Spice Girls revealed. Wow, here's Jerry Halliwell in some sizzling, you know, snaps. In the fall of 1996, the Spice Girls single Wannabe was hot, and so were the five members of the group. The British public hungered for every detail of the girls' lives, and the press obliged. The tabloids were willing to reveal the good, the bad, and the ugly. A whole bunch of pictures came out from the uh, sordid past of Jerry Halliwell. Two months before the Spice Girls were to release their first album, Jerry Halliwell learned firsthand about the pitfalls of stardom. In October of 1996, the Sun newspaper published nude photos of the singer taken when she was a teenager. Jerry's Spice mates were not surprised. Everyone was prepared for it and they just got on and they gave support to Jerry and it was a united front. It was like, yes, she did do them, we're not going to deny it. She played it very well. They never had any regrets. That was the thing about the Spice Girls. Everything they did, they did with their head held high. On December 26, 1996, the band released its first album, Spice. Record sales exploded and so did the girls' fan base. Really? I think it's mad. You know, you don't, I don't think it actually sinks in until you read your fan, fan mail, mail, until you go and you see crowds of people screaming at you. The Spice Girls became pop royalty. They seemed right at home with Britain's other regal family. Journalist Mark Kemp. They met Prince Charles and there's a photograph in here of big lipstick mark on Prince Charles's face. With record sales booming, the group's manager, Simon Fuller, turned up the heat. He always had vision. It was always seen as a, as a global project. Um, and everything Simon does is big. You know, the sponsorship deals he did, the media coverage, everything he did with those girls was an event. In May 1997, Fuller orchestrated one of the biggest endorsement deals in pop music history. The group signed a multi-million dollar contract with soft drink giant Pepsi Cola. Even Hollywood couldn't resist the Spice Girls. In the summer of 1997, the girls began work on their film, Spice World. The movie was a comic look at a day in the life of Britain's most popular girl band. Oh, the film took eight to nine weeks, mm -hmm. yeah. But also, at the same time we were filming the movie, we were also writing the soundtrack, Spice World. After the movie wrapped, the Spice Girls continued to make media appearances and attend recording sessions. The girls were exhausted. Things, so it's 20 things all happening at once, and the one thing that you really need is to focus on the music. And in a way, as for all of us, then because of the nature of the machine, that then becomes the Spice Girls brand. According to Jerry, she started binging and purging food. She asked Fuller for a few days off, but he said no. Jerry became convinced the manager was more concerned about money than the girls. They suddenly began to think, hmm, this is very, this, our career could be very short-lived if all we do is, is, is just product placement and things, and that's how we're making our money. Um, 
we have to control. We don't want to be linked with these products anymore. In November 1997, on the eve of the MTV Music Awards, Jerry and Mel B joined forces and plotted a takeover. Jerry and Mel B, I think they got the rest of the girls into such a frenzy. They stayed up all night discussing it at MTV. They didn't go to bed and that they rang their lawyers at five in the morning and by the following morning, um, Simon had been informed that his services were no longer required. I think they just had enough and they felt it was, it was time for them to manage themselves. Ginger Spice was finally in control. And the last thing that Jerry Halliwell did was take a break. As soon as she got rid of Simon, they worked even harder because they had something to prove. Halliwell was determined to succeed. In December of 1997, the film Spice World premiered. They'll have a feel-good factor on it. You'll hopefully you'll leave that movie smiling, and that's what oh, I absolutely oh, bent over double laughing. The reviews weren't exactly glowing, but it would take more than poor reviews to bring the group down. That month, Posh Spice announced she was engaged to England's number one soccer player, David Beckham. You have to realise that people aren't always going to want to, you know, be interested in you so your family you have to make sure is is the strongest thing and the most important thing because they're always there for you as with any family there were bad times by March of 1998 reports started to circulate about dissension between Jerry and the other girls according to Jerry's autobiography the singer grew tired of the hectic routine and wanted time to find herself that spring, Jerry was scheduled to do a British TV interview with ITN News about her past scare with breast cancer. But Halliwell's bandmates decided the interview interfered with the group's performance schedule. The group canceled Jerry's interview. That was the final blow. On May 27th of 1998, the Spice Girls were scheduled to appear on London's National Lottery Show. Jerry was missing in action. It suddenly started leaking out. Hey, Jerry's not coming out to the car. The chauffeur's there, and she's not coming out. Something's happening. The next day, Halliwell's publicist made the news official. Ginger Spice was leaving the band. The news couldn't have come at a worse time. The Spice Girls were scheduled to begin their first American tour. Director Ian Denyer was hired to make a documentary about the tour. I was passing you know, news vendors placards on the street saying the Spice Girls are dead, um, Jerry has left, it's all over. Executives at Virgin Records launched into spin control. I arrived at the offices and said, well, I'm, that's it, I guess, you know, well, it's been nice. And they said, no, what are you talking about? You know, it's all going to be on. If five girls weren't touring, four girls will. In June 1998, Sporty, Scary, Baby, and Posh jumped the pond and kicked off their U.S. tour. Despite Ginger's absence, the band carried on. As long as our fans are there and they're, they're as loyal, you know, which they look like they are going to be, or that they are being, then that's all that matters to us. Coming up, Surviving Spice. You're alone by yourself and it's like starting over. Within the span of 21 months, the Spice Girls went from nobodies to international pop icons. But in the spring of 1998, on the eve of the group's big American concert tour, the band was in turmoil. Ginger Spice, Jerry Halliwell, called it quits. The diva's departure made front page news and fueled rumors Spice Mania was over. Girls as, as young as three years old, and they were distraught, crying, asking for Jerry. After leaving the Spice Girls, Jerry Halliwell described her feelings to her fans. It's like leaving a marriage. You say goodbye to the whole establishment, the friends, the family, everything. So you start, so you're alone by yourself, and it's like starting over. And starting over is exactly what Jerry's bandmates decided to do. They managed to turn it into um, a heartbreaking challenge. You know, our friends has left, but we must pick ourselves up and go on. Two years after Ginger's departure, Scary, Posh, Baby, and Sporty released Forever, the group's first album since Spice World. The record received mixed reviews, but sold more than two million copies. Hopefully we will be together forever, but you, you know, you never know what's going to happen. But you can never take away from us what we have achieved yeah. as a group. Soon after, the girls ventured out on their own. All five pursued solo careers. While Mel C stayed single, her Spice mates started families. In 1998, Melanie Brown married Spice Girls dancer Jimmy Gulzer. Six months later, Brown gave birth to daughter Phoenix Chai. Two years later, the couple divorced. 
In 2006, Brown had a brief romance with actor Eddie Murphy. In April 2007, Mel gave birth to daughter Angel Iris. DNA tests proved Murphy was Angel's father. Brown demanded child support. Angel is my baby and Eddie's. She will always know that she was planned and wanted by the both of us. Murphy admitted fathering Angel, but denied planning the child. Eddie also insisted he covered Mel's pregnancy expenses and paid child support. The dispute landed in court. In June 2007, Melanie Brown married movie producer Stephen Belafonte. Jerry Hallowell welcomed her first child, daughter Bluebell Madonna, in May 2007. Jerry did not identify the father. Three months later, Emma Bunton also had her first son, Bo. Emma's boyfriend, Jay Jones, was her baby daddy. Of all the Spice Girls, Victoria Adams achieved the greatest post-breakup celebrity. In March 1999, Posh gave birth to son, Brooklyn. Then on July 4th that year, Victoria and soccer star David Beckham tied the knot. The couple's wedding reportedly cost more than $800,000. Both bride and groom wore crowns and took their vows while seated on matching thrones. That was the moment when people just went, my God, she is, she's like Princess Diana. The Beckham family soon grew to five with the arrival of sons Romeo and Cruz. Then in 2007, the Beckhams moved to America. David signed with the Los Angeles soccer team and Posh and Bex went Hollywood. They're widely regarded as the, uh, the, the king and queen of showbiz really. You know, people absolutely loved it. But girl power wasn't forgotten. On June 28, 2007, seven years after their breakup, the ex-bandmates reconvened. They kissed, made up, and announced that the Spice Girls were reuniting. We felt an enormous amount of support from a lot of people to get back together. Yeah. So we're doing it for ourselves, our fans, and you know everyone out there. They also planned a world concert tour. I'm excited, you know, we've got some shows in America. Um, I'm excited, the kids are excited, Davey's excited. I think all of our families are so behind yeah. what we're doing. On November 13th, 2007, the Spice Girls released their greatest hit CD. The message was loud and clear. England's most popular girl band ever was back. Have you forgiven Jerry? No, <laughs> absolutely mm. not. No, of course, we, we love each other, we're all yeah, friends. Absolutely. There's nothing to forgive. Oh, isn't that lovely? Yeah.